Okay guys, today we're going to start uh, talking about uh, how to determine geological ages. And if you remember uh, the last unit, this is exactly uh, kind of what we did during the entire last unit. Um, so we're kind of bridging two units together today uh, so that we can learn a little bit more about the history of Earth. So it says here in our assignment that evidence of past life on Earth can be found in the fossil record. Fossils are among the most important tools scientists use to interpret Earth's history. Not only can they help in dating rock layers, they also reveal the changing nature of life over the vast scale of Earth's history. Fossil and relative and absolute dating have also told us that we know about geological changes, what we know about geological changes on Earth. From the gradual rearrangements of the continents to cataclysms that caused mass extinctions. In this investigation, you'll try to try your hand at using fossils, relative dating, and radiometric dating to uncover some of Earth's history. So there's three different techniques that we're going to utilize here. Uh, we're going to be using relative dating. Okay. We're going to be using radiometric dating, which remember deals with radioactivity um, and is an exact method of dating. Uh, gives us an actual uh, date. And relative dating, of course, gives us a position of a fossil as to whether it's, or as a rock layer, as whether it's older or younger than the one, um, the others that are in the sequence. And then, of course, fossils, which are really kind of a, a technique for relative dating in, in a way. So there's three different techniques we're going to use in our spurs throughout this activity. Uh, let's take a look here. This activity incorporates information from chapter 12 and 13. Uh, how are these two chapters related? Well, chapter 13 is the current chapter that we're in, and it's all about the history of the Earth. So it's about all the different periods of Earth's history, the eras, the eons. Um, chapter 12 was really about dating. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to say here that uh, the dating... methods from chapter 12 They allow us to understand the fossil record. So in this chapter, uh, we're, we're putting it all together so that we can talk about the history of life on our planet, right? So um, th those two things really go hand in hand. Um, the next question here talks about why is it important to have more than one dating technique available? Um, there are so many reasons for this. Um, the, the first one that I can think of is that um, different techniques So some techniques allow us to date um, further into Earth's past than other techniques. Uh, that's kind of a very important uh, reason for this. And it's uh, when we looked at radiometric dating, we realized that some radioisotopes allowed us to date very recently, like carbon dating, and some allowed us to date very, very distant things, like when we use things like uranium and rubidium and things like that. We can date much further into Earth's past. Um, so having those different options is important. Uh, we mentioned dendrochronology, like where we can actually date based on the rings that are in trees and in fossil trees. So uh, those things allow us to date much more recently. Um, the other very important fact of having more than one dating technique is that it's going to allow us
it allows us to be certain that the techniques actually work. Okay, and the reason for that is there's some overlap. So because, because our techniques actually overlap, uh, we can know that they're actually functional. If, for instance, you got a date from uh, radiometric dating that placed a, a layer of rock uh, in a location sequentially that was different than what you got from relative dating or dating with fossils, index fossils, you've got a big problem because all of a sudden your dating techniques are invalid. Uh, so the fact that every single different technique, and these are just three that we're talking about here today, um, all line up and all give us acceptable values and are in agreement with each other allows us to be very certain that our techniques are valid and that they actually work. So that's that's a really that's probably the most important point right there. But in another thing I could add here is that sometimes you've got a situation where only one technique will work because of the fact of, you know, what what you have in the rock, what kind of rock it is, whether it's got fossils or it doesn't have fossils. So you can't use fossils to date with if you've got no fossils, right? Um, you can pretty much always use uh, the relative dating techniques of superposition and things like that. Radiometric dating, again, is very specific. You've got to have the specific radioisotope in the rock for that to work, and that usually means having an igneous rock. So when we combine all these together, we can get a really nice picture of Earth's history. Um, so let's see a look at the next one here. Uh, look at the geological time scale um, in the data bank. How are the eras, uh, periods, and epochs like the divisions used in textbooks? So I'm going to zip ahead here, and we'll take a look. Here we go. Here's our geological time scale. It's nice it's in color here for us. Um, and we can see over on the left here, this is not to scale. So um, not even remotely close to scale. Uh, but this, this area, this if we go from the bottom up, that's the best way to read this, um, we have this vast area of well, it's not really an eon, but it's known as Precambrian time. It's all of these other uh, eons combined. It's the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic. Uh, and th this is a vast period of geological history here. Um, and it starts from the bottom with the origins of Earth. Um, and then it works all the way upwards till we reach what's known as the Phanerozoic eon, which is the eon of visible life. Um, and that is then broken down. The Phanerozoic is broken down into the Cenozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Paleozoic, uh, which we've talked about some already. Uh, the Paleozoic being ancient life, the Mesozoic being middle life, where the dinosaurs were, and then the Cenozoic being recent life, the age of the mammals. So uh, if, we, if we follow those outwards, we could then break just this segment of geological time, these eras, up into individual periods. So here's the Cenozoic over here, and there's we've got two periods in there, the Quaternary and the Tertiary. Uh, then we've got the Mesozoic here, which breaks into the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, the Triassic, okay? And then we can look at the Paleozoic. Well, we've got a lot of breakout there, the Permian, the Carboniferous, the Devonian, the Silurian, the Ordovician, and the Cambrian. So in many ways, this is really similar to uh, the divisions that we might see in a textbook uh, because we you know we have like a, a table of contents to kind of orient ourselves we've got these bigger headings over here and then we break those headings down into sections you know and we break those sections down into um, I don't know maybe paragraphs right and then we've got those paragraphs broken down into sentences it's sort of kind of similar to that um, let me just erase this here I've made a mess there we go I'm going to need this again here in a second. I don't want it all messed up. There we go. Okay. So let's go back over to our questions here. Okay. As an analogy, uh, the geological time scale, it, it, it's kind of similar because it's, um, it's, I would say it's carefully... Maybe even just 
logically broken into related segments. So whereas you might go, you know, um, what we said there, we said we had a book, and then we said we've got chapters. Might go into sections, right? In the same way that we might have um, eras going into periods, right? And then so on and so forth. Right? Okay. What's the purpose of this activity? Well, the purpose of this activity um, is to use dating techniques Order a sequence of rocks. Um, there we go. Okay, down below we have a block diagram and um, we've got a scale that shows us the, it's a logarithmic scale that shows us the decay of U-235, that's uranium-235, um, and we've got our resources in the data bank here at the end of the activity. So we're going to start with some relative dating here and it says, carefully study the, the block diagram below Use the rules you've learned for determining relative age to find the sequence of geologic events. List their letters from oldest to youngest in the space provided beside the figure. Okay, so uh, we've done some of this before, and uh, some of you struggled with it a little bit, so let's just kind of work our way through this a little. So remember the first rule that we learned about in relative dating is the, the law of superposition, which tells us that, that the oldest thing is always on the bottom, right? We also learned the law of cross-cutting relationships, which tells us that anything that cuts through something else has got to be younger than what it cuts through. Okay, so we've got both of those scenarios going on here um, in various ways. So let's see if we can sort this out because uh, I haven't done this yet, so it's a little bit, might take me a second to sort it. So let's start with the bottom. The oldest thing here has got to be A. A is on the very bottom. And you'll notice there are things that cut through it. We've got a fault here. We've got this granite pluton here that's coming up this way. We've got a dike here. We've got another dike here. We've got another fault over here. A lot of stuff going on. If something cuts through something, it's younger than what it's cutting through. So that means that all these other things are younger. So we've got to put A on the bottom. Okay. The next thing up is going to be pretty simple here. It's just going to have to be going up to B. Okay. So let's go to B here. Okay. Going upwards, we've got up to C now because... I've got to be careful with this granite uh, pluton over here because it, it cuts through some stuff, right? It cuts through all these layers, so it's got to be younger than the layers it cuts through. Well, it cuts all the way up through to E. If you see there, it cuts right up to E. So that means that it's, it's younger all the way up through E. So I've got A, B, C, D, 
E, so it's just going in order up to this point. And now we got some stuff to sort out here. So a fault M cuts all the way through layer E, okay? Then what we're seeing here is M's gotta be the next youngest thing there, okay? And what I thought was a sill here with the basalt is basalt that must have just spilled out onto the surface here um, because there had to have been an erosion event here because we're missing some material over here. So that means that our next thing that had to occur was this basalt dike here, L. Okay, this is a complex one. Okay, and I've also got K over here. Okay, and K is also cutting through a whole bunch of stuff here. So K cuts through uh, the basalt. Uh-oh, now we got a problem. Okay, that means that, that, that N can't be younger than K, right? So um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have a situation here, I'm gonna have to erase some stuff again. You have to play with these a little bit here sometimes, right? So we've got all those taken care of. Like that. So we're going to have to have, after, after this basalt dike, we've got to have some more layers here put down. And it looks like just about everything else is cutting through everything. So let's just go ahead and throw those in here quick. So we got up through E. We're going to start with F. So we're back here with F. G. H and I. Let's see if this works out now. Okay. K cuts through everything. Okay. It also, I mean, it's even cutting through the granite pluton in a way because it's cutting through the basalt dike, which cuts through that. So uh, it's technically cutting through every single thing there. So that means that K is going to be my, my youngest item up here. Okay. Now it's pretty much what we just did before. So since L is, L is cutting through uh, the, the granite J here, okay, that means that L has got to be younger than the granite. Okay, And that means the granite must go right here. So let's see if this makes sense. It's always good when you finish writing one of these out, and then you erase this mess, that you walk through the entire thing to double check yourself. Because see how easy it is to make some mistakes? There were a couple there I didn't see until I started writing them down and then I was able to figure it out. So let's try this again here. Okay, we start with we start with A down here. First thing gets put down, then B. Okay, then C, then D, then E. Okay, then I said the next thing that was going to happen was M. M is a fault that causes all of these rock layers to shift. Okay, this, this wall falls down, this wall slips up. So these two are together, these two are together. They were, right? Those two used to be together, those two used to be together, used to be together. And this one here doesn't have a matching sequence above it, which means that what that told me after I saw that was that this is an erosion surface here. Material has been lost on that. So that was pretty helpful because I wasn't sure if this was a basalt dike or if it had just spilled out onto the surface. Um, but there's an erosion surface there. So the next step thing was definitely fault M cut through all those layers. Okay. Um, then there's some erosion happened. Okay. And then what happened was we had, uh, I said L here, which L is my basalt dike. So the basalt, uh, this doesn't work here. <laughs> See, it's good that I worked through that. I don't have an N on there. Do I have a letter twice here? I don't see it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, I got two L's. Yeah, I messed up. 
So after M, I can't have L. Weep. Okay, we're gonna have to continue with our sequence here uh, with F, G, H, and I. Let me fix that. F, G, H, and I. Okay, there we go. Okay, oops. Okay, so F, G, H, and I. Get put down. F, G, H, and I. Get put down. And now we've got to we've got to sort the rest of this out. I think I've got it probably in the right spot. I just messed up L. So um, the next thing that's got to happen is that there's got to be a fault that um, is going to cut through all of this stuff. Okay, and that's fault N. So fault N cuts through everything else here. Okay, so all those layers, all these layers here had to be put down before fault n can happen, okay? After fault n, uh, there's a lot of stuff that cuts through that, okay? Um, after fault n, the next thing we've got here is the, it would have to be the granite, okay? Because the granite's cutting through the fault line right here, okay? The next thing is gonna have to be the basalt um, because and yeah, said that, wait, yeah. And J, there we go, L. <laughs> I should keep myself in order here. L, because it's gonna cut through both the fault and the granite. So L's the next thing, and then we've got something over here that's cutting through L, and that's K. So K is the very most recent thing that just happened. Woo, boy, that was a doozy. Okay, that was a heck of a block diagram, that was kind of fun. So, here we go, erase all this so we can look back at it if we need to. And we've now got that all sorted out. Okay, and you'll notice that there's three fossils here that are found in some different layers, right? We've got a trilobite there, uh, we've got some sort of a little snail shell there, a mollusk, um, and then we've got uh, some plant fossils there on the end, some little um, plant leaf sprigs there. So, let's go ahead and move forward. I think that's all that page. Okay. Next up. So this uh, data table contains information about the parent-daughter ratios of the isotope U-235. Of the layers in the block diagram. So I've got my layers listed here, G, F, D, and B, and then the percent U-235 that we've got in there. And we want to have the absolute age um, for these, and then we're going to try and place them in a period. So, just at a glance here, I can just I can already see how old some of these are, relatively based on the percentage of U two thirty five. So if they have, looks like this is ordered from largest to smallest. The, the smaller amount of U-235 that they have in them, since that's the parent uh, isotope, uh, th that means that they're going to be older. So in this, in this, I mean, like I've already got the relative dates here, and I do on the other side, but this, this should be older than this. Let's just go check that quick. Is B older than, than G? Let's check that on the other page there. So B older than G. And indeed I do. I have B older than G. How about that? The two dating techniques are going to agree before I even do it. But let's go ahead and do it and see if we can figure it out. So um, let's work this out with the, with the logarithmic uh, graph below. We have, uh, this is the half-life of U235. The half-life graph is plotted on a logarithmic scale, which straightens out the curved line for radioactive decay. That's why all these lines here are all funny squished up. We did that so that we could make this line nice and straight and easy to read. So uh, just
just be careful when we're looking at these, uh, what you're looking for, like if I'm, if I'm trying to read this scale over here and this one says 10, well, 15 is in the middle here, okay? 20, 25 is in the middle here. Look at the, the distances are, are different between the lines, okay? That's because of the way we've squished this table, but you just still have to kind of figure about where half is so you can read the thing. So let's start here with rock layer G. It's got 94% U235 in it. So I've got 80 here. So um, looks like 90 is going to be this line right here, right? Which means that 94 is going to be um, almost halfway up to the 100 there. So this thing is going to be... I can't draw with this pen on here. I'm gonna try and do this. We're looking at about halfway down this. Okay, I'm not really can't really draw that there. But we're talking about something. Let's look at our scale here at the bottom. Four. This would be five, six, seven, eight, right? So, um, so we're talking. This is uh, zero. This would be. 200 right so this is going to be 100 here so we're talking about like maybe about a little half of that again maybe a little bit more less than half of that or more than half of that so we're talking about i don't know maybe 40 million years right if this is if this is 200 and this is 150 is half of that so maybe i'm talking like uh, yeah about like 40 40 million years for that so that's going to be kind of my guess it's a little hard to read that okay but remember this is in this is in million years right so don't get confused there okay so now f f is f is at 90 so at 90 is right on this line here in 90, let me erase some of this. Ninety is right where this intersects. 80, 90. So I can follow the line right on down. And that one isn't even labeled for me there conveniently. That's 70 million years. So we're gonna put a 70 there. 60 uh, 65. So 65. Here's 60. 70 is that next line there. So 65 is obviously in the middle of those two. So follow that across to where it goes. It's about right there. Hard to draw there. And then I'm going to drop down. Well, this is, they gave me this line here, 350 million years. That's helpful. This is 400, though, right? Um, and we said that this was 600. That means this right here halfway is going to be about 500. Um, so we're looking at, it's about maybe halfway to that again, so we're looking at about 450. That was a big jump, wasn't it? A tiny little difference in percentage of U235 can mean a gigantic difference um, in age, right? So the measurements of these things need to be really precise. And believe me, scientists are using something better than this little uh, percent U235 table that we've got right here. Uh, it's got to be way more exact than that. Um, th this is just a demonstration. So let's go with 60 here. There's 60. We're going to see where we're at here on the table. Uh, so 60 puts us right on this line here. It's us right there, smack dab in the middle of these two, pretty much. So that puts us smack dab at 500 million years. Awesome. Now let me just go ahead and erase some of this mess here. Make sure that you understand how to read this table, because I'm going to ask you some questions about this, okay? So if I give you a percent U235, okay, all you need to do is look over here at this at this side of the graph, okay, the y-axis there, find it, and then follow 
across to where you intersect the actual line that's going across the graph, drop down, and then read it off. But remember, over here on, on this side of the graph, these numbers, they're, they're squished up, so you got to figure out where half is. So if this is 40, that next line is 50, which means in between those two is 45. So don't screw that up, okay? And on the bottom here, these things are making jumps by um, 200, right? So if this is 12, right, then 13 here is here, 14 is there, 15 is here, 16 is right there. So make sure you understand the scale before you go writing down a number, okay? Just look carefully at the scale. Let's go on down here. It takes 713 million years for half a sample of U-235 to decay to lead. Use the ge geologic timescale resource 10 in the data bank to complete data table 1 with the period during which each rock layer formed. Okay, so we don't really need this U-235 information here, but let's go ahead and take a look here. We're at the first layer rock G is at 40 million years. Let's go over here, and we'll find, whoop, where are we at there? So at, here's our age in millions of years ago. Uh, here's 33, so 40 million years is about right there. So that puts a square in the tertiary period. Remember, it asked me for the period. It didn't ask me for the epic or the era. It asked me for the period. So be careful what you're getting asked for. Oops. There's the tertiary. Okay. Now we're at 70 million years. So there's 65, so 70 is going to be somewhere after that. It doesn't really matter where, because that's going to slap me right into the Cretaceous. Okay. Okay, right into the Cretaceous period. Four hundred and fifty million years. There's four hundred, four forty three, four fifty drops me down here into the Ordovician. It's a little bit bigger here, so I can write easier. division. Now we're at 500 million years. 500, that's square. There's 490, 500 square in the Cambrian. There's not a very good D there. Yeah, it's a little bit better. <laughs> it's hard to write on this thing. There we go. So um, we have all the the periods. We've got the layers here. Let's um, let's go ahead and write that in while we've got it here. So we've got B is the Cambrian. That's rock layer B. Let me I'll write it over here. I don't want to do that. Maybe it'll be easier to write the actual date. So let's put 500 million for B. Four fifty for D. Okay. Seventy for F.
44G. So that's going to help me out here in a little bit. Okay, back to this. So next we're going to utilize index fossils. Remember, index fossil is a fossil that lived through a short period of geological time uh, before going extinct or uh, changing, evolving. So we can use those fossils. If we find them, we can know how old the layer is. Um, so right here it's asking us the approximate age of the index fossils. It's asking us for a period um, in what the fossil is. So let's look here. Rock layer C, what's the index fossil? Rock layer C. Okay, here's our index fossil here, rock layer C. And I'm going to abbreviate some of that. I think we've got, yeah, we do, don't we? Good, so. That's weird, I think they actually used the wrong, they did. They used the wrong fossil for this. That's actually a graptolite, and they put a picture of a snail shell. Oh, well. So C, um, I'm going to write that down on this next page here, what that is. And I'm going to abbreviate T. I need a smaller pen. Uh, There we go, okay, hold on a second. Let's get all these written down while we're at it. That's E. D. Americanus. Okay. And A. the trilobite, Parad Paradoxides pinus. Okay, now they want the periods. We'll check this out. Since we have um, a key to index fossils, that makes it really easy. So let's look for Fructicosis? Fructicosis. There we go. Check that out. And uh, here it is right down here, which has a nice picture of a graptolite, um, which is not what they put on the other page, which is, I guess nobody really picked up on that. So somebody goofed up. Um, so this thing puts it right in the Ordovician period. Check that out. Um, let's look up D. Americanus. D. Americanus is right here. Wait a minute. D. Americanus, didn't they have a... They did. They had a picture of a plant fossil there, and I was thinking that wasn't the right name. <laughs> Somebody screwed those pictures all up, because this is a brachiopod, and I'm pretty sure that, that D. Americanus is a brachiopod. Anyway, Pennsylvania period, right? And then P... 
Pinus. See if that's really a trilobite. Yep. They got that one right. It's only one. Cambrian. Okay. And then that uh, can help us with the approximate age here. So let's see if we've got the... So we're going to have to pull, turn back to our diagram here. Okay. So uh, here's the geological timeline. And we said that uh, Tetragraptus was in the Ordovician. So um, we've got kind of a range here, right? It's somewhere between 490 to 443. Okay. Um, so we could guess in the middle there, we could just put, you know, 490 to 443. Um, I, I, in re realistically, we would know more specifically than that um, because we'd have an index fossil guide. So 490 or 443 to 490. Oops. Wait a minute. That's not right. Yeah, okay. That's right. That is right. Okay. Okay, let's look at D. Americanus, which was in the Pennsylvanian. Here's the Pennsylvanian. So we're somewhere between... Uh, 290 to 323. So if we wanted to guess right in the middle of that, might be a good guess. And then finally the Cambrian, we just want the dates of that period. We're talking 490 to 540. Okay, so be able to interpret uh, this table here, okay, and of course your key to index fossils. This is pretty simple though, isn't it? If you know what fossil you have, you just look at what period you've got, and then you could even tell what era you're in, okay? So, we've got all those, good. So now we've got some approximate ages for these guys. Um, so let's, uh, Let's throw some of those on this other page here, okay, and see if these dates actually work out properly. So we've got rock layer C, and let's just uh, spitball here, uh, 50, 60, I don't know, let's say 470, okay, just to throw it in there to see if it works. Does 470 for C work? Oh yeah, it does, doesn't it? 450, 470, 500. Very nice. How about uh, rock layer E? Okay, 290, uh, let's do like 310-ish, right? E310. That work? Yep, that works. 70, 310, 450. It's a big jump there from 70, isn't it? And then finally, rock layer A, uh, 490 to 554. So, I don't know. I don't know, 520 ish, somewhere in that region. And that certainly works, doesn't it? So 500, 520, 525-ish, somewhere in that, in that range. There you go. All right, so it's nice that our, our layers are lining up so well, right? We have vast agreement between the three different dating techniques, right? So you dated with index fossils, you dated with uh, radioactive isotopes, U-235. You dated 
with relative dating with the block diagram and every single one of these things lines up correctly. So that gives me really good faith that uh, this these dating techniques work really well because if a single one of those had been out of order, uh, something we'd have to call into question a lot of our scientific dating techniques, wouldn't we? So let's look at the questions here. Which law, principle, or doctrine of relative dating did you apply to determine the relative ages of rock layers H through H and I? Well, let's take a look at H and I. H and I. There's H and there's I. Well, I'll give you a choice here. Is that cross-cutting relationships or is that, oops, uh, is that cross-cutting relationships or is that, um, uh, is that law of superposition? Now, obviously, I is above H, so that's law of superposition. Law of superposition. The one is above the other. Which law, principle, or doctrine relative dating did you apply to determine the relative ages of fault M and rock layer F? Well, you probably make a guess because that said fault M and F. Let's see here. M, 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 M. Where's fault M? Fault M is over here. Uh, F. Where's F? F is this layer up here. Okay. So fault M doesn't cut through fault F. So what helped us there to know that um, F has to be younger than M since it doesn't cut through it is of course the law of cross-cutting relationships. There we go. Explain how you know that fault N is older than the igneous intrusion J. So why is N older than J? N is older than J. We'll take a look up here. We had to sort this out. Which one cuts through the other one? J cuts through N, so that means J is younger. Okay, because J cuts through N, that's why. That's why we know the younger one, J, is going to cut through the older one. Why are there no index fossils in the granite and the basalt? Well, think about what granite and basalt are, right? There's your granite. There's your basalt dike. Those are both what kind of rocks? Those are, of course, igneous rocks. Not going to have a fossil in a rock. It was made from molten material, right? Not going to be too likely. Okay, um, where are fossils? Fossils are found, oops. Fossils are found in sedimentary rocks. Okay, fossils are found in sedimentary rocks. Those are igneous rocks. How did you determine the sequence of the three igneous intrusions? Okay, let's look at those again. We've got the granite, the basalt, and another basalt over here. Okay, how did we know those? Well, it's the same as before, right? Uh, we had to utilize. The only way to tell those was cross-cutting relationships again, right?
remember, that was uh, that was kind of complex. So you guys saw me, like I worked it through a couple of times to get it right. Uh, there's there's a lot of complexity going on there. All right, we had to sort out the fact that, um, well, J was cutting through uh, N, but L cut through both J and N. So that made L younger than either of those two. And then we had to look over here at K, and we found out that K was cutting through everything because it was cutting through the basalt as well there, right here. So, uh, and it cut all the way up to the surface. So that placed K as the youngest thing on my list up here. Okay, and then the only way to sort it out further um, was to, of course, you know, we had to use that fault there, and uh, this fault over here, fault M, helped us too. Uh, but we had to use different parts of the diagram to actually figure that out. It wasn't like super duper simple, was it? It was, uh, there were some tricks there. It took us a little bit to sort it out. Okay. I just kind of simplified and said cross-cutting relationships there, but there's a, a longer explanation, right? So how is it possible for two distinct rock layers to derive from the same period? Okay, so how could you have two distinct rock layers that came from the same period? Let's look back here at our, I don't think I didn't write the ages on there, but um, maybe, maybe we should try and do that. Let's see here. Can we do that? Let's give it a try here. We could do it for some of them probably. So we've got... We said G was 40 million. Well, that was going to take a long time. I guess I won't go, I won't go through the whole... Well, I guess we could. I've got a paper here. We can. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look back at this, okay? And I'm going to figure out what period those things fall in based on their dates. Okay, so just like before... I'll do one here with you. So if I've got, um, oops, if I've got G at 40 million, oh, I already did it. <laughs> so um, 40 million is the tertiary G. Write that down there quick. I'm ready to go over to the side. Okay. Cretaceous for. F Okay. Or division for D. Oops. Let's see if we have any that are the same. Cambrian for B. Okay, let's check the ones on the other page. Um, or division for C. Yeah, there's a duplicate there, isn't it? E is Pennsylvanian, and A is Cambrian. Okay, okay. So we've got a couple here that are the same, right? Both D and C are Ordovician, and both B and A are Cambrian. So looking at our diagram here, here's a and B, you know, one's right on top of the other, are the same uh, time period, and both C and D uh, are also the same time period. Now, that really shouldn't surprise us, right? Because geological time periods span a, a long, long time. So, yeah, there can be more than one rock layer that makes up a geological period, right?
that's how we divide things down even further from periods into, say, epics, and then we can we can even go further than that. We keep dividing things down because there's, you know, a lot of rock layers that are going to form within a period. A period can be a huge amount of time, like, you know, tens of millions of years. Um, that's a lot, right? <laughs> so um, there can be a lot of rock layers there. So anyway, um, now that we've got all this done, uh, you can go ahead and take your quiz. So let me just kind of back up. We'll just roll through this one more time really quick here. Um, we talked about, you know, the three different dating techniques, right? And why it was important to have those different dating techniques. Uh, we talked about how that's kind of similar to how chapters are in books. You know, we just keep breaking things down finer and finer. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the dating methods that really are what allow us to organize the entire history of life on our planet. So uh, in this picture, we spent some time talking about the block diagram. We sorted out all the relative dates. It was tricky, wasn't it? Um, remember the two different dating tech relative dating techniques we used in this one. The law of cross-cutting relationships, which tells us when something cuts through something else, it's younger than the thing that it cuts through. Okay. Um, we also utilize the law of superposition, which just tells us that when one layer is on top of another, it's younger than the layer it's on top of. The oldest stuff's always on the bottom. And you can see that represented in my my uh, layers over here where I organized from A to K, A is on the bottom, right? Okay. The next thing that we did here was we looked at the radioactive isotopes. So we did radiometric dating with this chart here and be able to read, um, be able to read this logarithmic graph. All right. I'm going to ask you some questions about it. So if I gave you a fossil, or I gave you a rock layer and I said so and such and such layer has some percentage of U-235 in it, can you come down here and actually look it up and figure it out? Okay, can you can you draw yourself a line across? But remember again, be careful with the scale, right? It goes like from here's 10, okay, 15 is in the middle, that's a big gap compared to 25, which is right there. Down here, it goes nice and even, but it's jumping by every 200 million years for each line. So 800, 1,000 would be right here, okay? This would be 900 be halfway in between, right? 1,100 would be halfway in between. So those things are gonna, they have, they've got a different scale, so be careful with that when I ask you the questions, okay? Um, then once you knew the, once you knew, of course, the absolute age up here, we could find the period. How did we find the period? Well, we just went over to this, right? And you need to be able to read this. So there it is again. We've got the different things that happened, oops, the different things that happened during this uh, time frame. The, the actual date, of course, in millions of years, and those dates are for the line. So this is this line right here. Um, by the way, we break these periods, many of them up into um, either the evolution of some really new stuff or uh, an extinction event, okay? So there's, there's a lot of extinction events within that are breaking these things up here, okay? Um, big one there, big one there. <laughs> um, then uh, this whole thing is a this whole thing is a blow up of this, okay? So we just blew up just this tiny little bit here because that's where most of life is. It's the Phanerozoic Eon. Okay, so be able to read this thing. Um, it's not too hard though. I'll give you a clear view there if you're gonna use this for the quiz. Otherwise you can print one off or open the PDF up on your computer. Okay, next thing we talked about was index fossils. And we had a bunch of index fossils here. So if I gave you an index fossil, you should be able to look at this, find your index fossil, okay? Find the period that it's in, find the index fossil, find the period. Okay, you could also even find the era, right? That would be of this era. This would be of this era. So pretty straightforward. I think you guys could probably figure that out. Let me go ahead and 
we'll just make this smaller so you can see the whole thing here. go there's the entirety of it so if you're trying to look up a fossil you could just look at this picture right here if you like okay all right so then we also got the ages for those by just simply comparing the period that they were in from this page with the geological time scale which is right here and it gave us the period so remember you have to kind of estimate the ages there because it's giving you the start and the end of each of those periods. Okay, I think that's pretty much about it. Go ahead and do your quiz and you're good to go.